the standards of our grandfathers, we are living in a science fiction world. I firmly believe that within the next 20 to 30 years, the first actual human Mars mission is going to happen. We have people landing on an alien world, another planet, for the first time in history. So that actually infers that I also believe that the very first human to walk on Mars is already born and might be going to an elementary school here in Cluj. Who knows? So here's my journey of truly going beyond. So my day job is developing one of the most advanced spacesuit simulators for Mars exploration. I log about more than 100 hours of uh, simulated extra vehicle activity, which is the term for spacewalk. I had about 30 minutes of weightlessness so far. And uh, here's what I would like to share with you. First of all, in my day job, sometimes I get to do pretty cool things. You know, like, like this is the most expensive car I've ever driven. It's about uh, 1.4 million euros. Um, took about 10 years to develop, and I was one of the first to make it dirty. Um, and the maximum speed it has is about like this. So it's not a lot of bang for the bucks. However, it's a very intelligent car. It's a Eurobot ground prototype. Uh, which we used in the Rio Tinto area in southern Spain to simulate a Mars mission there. Or we go to even further remote place on the surface of this planet, which to some extent is Mars-like. So this is me working in the northern Sahara with the Puli rover, which has been built by our friends from the Google Luna Prize team in Hungary in Budapest. Um, and so we are, we are also looking into human robotic interaction. So this this old quasi-religious debate, if you send humans or robots to Mars, it's old school. So we think about send them both because they have their each respective advantages and disadvantages. Uh, we not only explore on the surface, but we go below subsurface because we have good reason to believe that there are cave systems on Mars. We know those about, since about 10 years or so, where we believe if if, and that's a very big if, if life ever arose on Mars, um, like let's say four billion years ago, and then the environmental parameters got less favorable for life, like it's colder, you lose part of the atmosphere, you lose the magnetic field, uh, the surface becomes chemically reactive and so on, life would withdraw to what we call ecological niches. We call those niches the swan sea ecologies, where the last songs of life are being sung on a dying world. Now, we don't know if it happens, but if we want to do this on Mars, we need to be prepared also for Mars in cave exploration. That's exactly what we do here in the amazing Dachstein giant ice caves in Upper Austria, where we went a few hundred meters below the surface to see what the operational constraints are of going there with a spacesuit. Uh, and as you can imagine, there, these are magnificent sites. When you have uh, enough illumination power, you can actually light up the entire major cave there and look there for old traces of life with their advanced radar, which is actually slated for launch on the ExoMars mission a couple of, year, of years from now. So we go to places which are as Mars-like as we can have it. So on the left, you see a picture taken on the 15th of February 2013 in, no in the northern Sahara. So just uh, about a few hours after a severe sandstorm would hit our, our base camp. So even the color of the sky is not blue anymore. This is not Photoshop. This is what it looks like there. And the picture on the right has been taken just one week after at Gale Crater, uh, actually looking at Mount Sharp here, by the, um, a picture taken by the Math Science Lab Curiosity. So those, those two pictures, they are just one week apart, but they're also two worlds apart. I mean, this is living through science fiction, isn't it? Anyway, uh, but I'm not doing this alone. There's, there's, a, there's a large team in the background. This is one of, uh, one of our flight control rooms from Mission Support Center in Innsbruck in Western Austria, which is Earth, so to say, where we communicate with about 10 minutes time delay. So when you're standing on the surface of Mars and say, uh, how are you doing back on Earth? And then the answer comes back 20 minutes afterwards, yes, well, and how about you? So small talk gets pretty boring on Mars after some time. So you have to be pre precise. A skill you develop also for everyday life here on Earth as well. But you also have to make some concessions. We have people from 23 nations which took part in this expedition. We had more than 100 mostly volunteers who had such a strong passion for this exploration theme that they, are, they were willing to come with us. So you have to build up a high bandwidth uh, network for telemetry uh, transfers in the middle of nowhere, literally in the middle of, in the middle of uh, nowhere. Uh, but you also have to make some concessions because you're still on Earth. That means you have to make those camel-proof so that no you know, drunk camel runs it over in the night or so. 
Um, and you do uh, serious science, like here, you know? <laughs> and this is an experiment which is very really serious, about traverse planning or so. But okay, you, you were right. I mean, let's be honest. Driving in an air-conditioned spacesuit in the middle of the desert with a quad bike, I mean, how cool is that? Um, so that's also part of it. Not every, not every day, but it's part of my work as well. We also think about what happens if things go wrong. And we're not talking about fist fight with aliens. We're not talking about head exploding scenarios. We're talking about simple things like what if you spray an angle, you cannot walk back to the, mission, to the base station anymore, so you're stuck on Mars. And by definition, you're going to run out of oxygen, you're going to run out of power, you're going to freeze to death, you're going to die within a few hours. So that would be a bad thing to happen. So what do we do as Austrians? So I'm part of the Austrian space from when Austrians get stuck in the mountains. Uh, they usually have their biwak backpack, you know, there's a little tent uh, with them. So they basically uh, cuddle into a small tent and tough it out for the night and hope for the rescue party to arrive on the next day. And that's exactly what we ask our colleagues from the Technical University of Vienna. Like, can you make us a space age version of this? And they say, sure, how about this? So what you see here, it's what we call the deployable shelter. It's basically a structure about the size of a car wheel, and when you're, when you're in trouble, you simply unzip it, you unfold it, it goes floop, 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 and you have this. And then you pressurize it with a compressor, you close it, you seal it, and then you can survive the night there. The only thing we forgot where was the in-flight entertainment. We didn't bring a beamer for the late night movie. However, it was pretty comfy. Because you have hydraulics inside, so depending how you navigate within hydraulics, you can make a bench, a couch, a table. You just inflate whatever furniture you need inside. That's pretty cool. Um, we also work with rovers, as I said. Um, this is, again, the uh, Puli rover from our friends from Hungary, uh, from the uh, Puli team. And uh, we have the Magma rover in the background, which was developed by ABM Space in Poland. Now, when you have, then, two control centers for each, uh, one control center for each of the rovers, so two control centers plus a control center for humans, you need to start coordinating. Right now, all the uh, robots on Mars, they are teleoperated as a single. They're doing solo missions, so to say. But if you're doing several rover missions at the same place, you need to coordinate. Otherwise, you're risking, in this case, the first simulated interplanetary traffic accident. I, th I think Magma would have won. It's just bigger, like monster trucks on Mars. Um, but you need to be careful with the coordination, obviously, here. Uh, another thing is, we not only go subsurface or to the general surface of the uh, northern Sahara, we go as high as we can. We have high aspirations so we go to high places. What about glaciers? So we know there are glaciers on Mars. Glaciers are water sources on Mars, and they are astrobiological hotspots as well, just like the caves are. And so we set the high altitude record at almost 3,000 meters, 2,887 meters. Actually, that record was set by our analog astronaut, my colleague, uh, Karti Kumar, who comes from the Netherlands, <laughs> quite a distance. Um, so so, so we are, we're doing extreme things sometimes. Uh, so these are magnificent moments, moments of high aspiration, moments of sheer wow. Yeah. Uh, are you being paid for this? Oh, that's cool. Um, and then you go back to the laboratory. You, you do performance envelope measurements. You go into sensor calibrations. You're measuring the electromagnetic emission as precise as you can of the suit to understand how it works. We've developing this suit for eight years now, um, and we still don't understand it yet fully. Yeah? It's called Aouda X. Aouda is this Indian princess from the uh, Shil Verne's novel, Journey Around the World in 80 Days. You know that the novel may be? It's an Indian princess he rescues in the end and that marries at the end of the, the novel. So to us, she's like a princess. She's really very beautiful to look at, but she's also high maintenance, I have to say. Okay, so we got to co-place a cryo test at minus 110, or in this case, minus 75 degrees Celsius. So we're looking for Martian temperatures. That's something uh, we did also in January this year. Or you take even higher risks, risks that are potentially life-threatening as well. So what we do here, we are simulating dust devils on Mars. We know there are dust devils on Mars. They have electrostatic discharges. And so lightning strikes of Mars are able to happen, although you don't have really a thunderstorm happening on Mars. And so this is a Tesla coil, which is ejecting lightning strikes at 6 million volt. And when you're standing in this spacesuit, you know, th this happened less than a, about more than a month ago, actually. Uh, and these are those moments when, okay, people have got killed by Tesla cults previously, and now I voluntarily are exposed to those strikes. Um, and those are those moments when you have to trust the numbers, you have to trust your engineering team, you have to trust the paramedics and standby if something happens. Uh, so, so we are taking risk, obviously, here. And then being asked, why are you taking those risks? Why are you putting so much effort into it? And then I 
uh, then I think about this, this picture. This is a very old picture. Actually, what, imagine being the archaeologist uh, of Sir Carter, who uh, was uh, this, what is the, one of the discoverers of the, uh, of the tombs of Tutankhamun uh, in, uh, in Egypt, uh, which means you're looking at an untouched seal which is 3,245 years old. So no one knows anymore what's behind the door. And this moment of going through the seal and opening the door, that's exactly what we're doing. The difference is we're not looking into what our ancestors did, but we're going much deeper into what the universe is about. It's like entering a library with full of books not a human soul has seen before. And that's what is, what's it about when we talk about exploration. So when we think about Mars, we talk about a, a barren, dry, cold desert. Look, looks a little bit like your last Egypt vacation, I guess. However, um, you have to understand it's a highly diverse world. It might be you know, very dry right now. You know, we have minus 70 degrees Celsius average temperature, one, less than 1% of the atmospheric pressure of the Earth, only one-third of gravity, a highly chemically reactive surface, and so on and so forth. But we also see things like this, sedimentary structures. You see all the layerings, and you don't have to be a geologist to realize, oh, there have been sediments going down from a, from a lake or maybe even the ocean. We have good reason to believe Mars had liquid water up to 3.5 billion years ago, including oceans with a depth of three kilometers. You could go deep sea diving on the red planet 3.5 billion years ago. Ain't that cool? Now, the thing is that all this evidence we, we had suggested here, and this is a, another selfie like the first speaker indicated. This is uh, also one of the most remote selfies ever taken by the uh, uh, Mars Science Lab Curiosity. And note, these are, on the left side, these are not the steps of the photographer. This is where they shovel up the, uh, the, the surface samples. So all the evidence suggests one thing, and that is Mars once had all the prerequisites for developing life. It was warmer, had a denser atmosphere, had an intact magnetic, magnetic field. It was much more hospitable. It was, we believe, it may be even habitable, but we don't know if it was inhabited. These are two different things, habitable and inhabited. And so there's one way to find out, and it's hell, let's go over there and, and, and find out. So, so instead of what Hollywood tries to teach us of like, bring it home, bring it home, I said, no, 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 take us there. We want to know. Take us there. So, this picture is one of my favorite pictures, uh, and it's similar to what we saw in the first presentation. Uh, is a picture of Earth seen from Mars just after sunset. And the, the nice thing about this picture is it's taken with a wide-angle camera, which somewhat reproduces the angle of view of a human sight. So one day, some, someday there will be humans standing there and seeing this picture in full color with somewhat the same resolution. That's us. That's, that's all we are. Everybody you know who ever lived, every dream ever lived, every story ever told, that's in this little dot right there. And so, yes, we, we have the privilege of working for the next generation. Maybe I will be too old for doing this voyage. We just we call ourselves analog astronauts. So in, in anal analogy to future missions, we're preparing for this. We're doing this also for the next generation. So, by the way, this, this picture, um, it's also a, a father and daughter in real life. So they are at the picture when she kisses him on the helmet or something. It's like, yuck, like this. Um, so we're doing this for the, for the next generation, trying to find our way uh, trying to explore something nobody else has been doing before, using technology uh, which, which is not yet existing. We have to develop so many things which you cannot simply buy on, on eBay. You have to really go beyond and, and do, it, do it for yourself in a way. So um, for those missions, we understand for the actual mission going to happen in the next 20 or 30 years. It takes engineering ingenuity, a, a society with the will to explore Dreamers with that everlasting itch for things remote. Do you know that, that feeling when you're just about to plan your next big vacation? This itching of where am I going to do? What am I going to discover there? Um, you need also poets to tell the story. You need people who are able to communicate uh, as a human what's it like to stand there and literally feel the winds through the spacesuit, so to say. And it will not be easy. 
There will be problems. There will be setbacks. There will be people saying, no, 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 we, we cannot do it. There will be people saying, yo, we shouldn't do it. We have enough problems here. But like for all dreams, going beyond means rising to the challenge. And that's the th a pattern we've seen again and again throughout our, our history. The world we're living in, remember what I said at the beginning, the world we're living in according to our standards is pure science fiction world. We are living in science fiction world because of all the dreamers, because we are standing on the shoulders of giants. But everywhere, it's not an easy, thi an easy thing. So I am um, I'm trying to encourage you here to going beyond. And there's a wish, a recommendation, and an offer I can make to you. And it's such an important wish, such an important offer, that for to hear this offer, I would all ask you to stand up. Please, everybody, stand up. Stand up in the audience. Please, everybody standing. All the rows, stand up, all the way. Okay. And here's my wish to you. May you believe in yourself. May you play big. Even when there is no safety net. May you rise to the challenge and then rise again. May you risk, may you explore, may you go beyond, and above all, may you shine. Thank you.